Okay, so we're starting. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Josh Iyer, and I welcome y'all all to uh, the Let's Talk series with um, Carolyn and Jonathan Wingo and Suzanne Henson. This is the uh, Wellbama talk that uh, we have scheduled for today. We're doing this uh, wonderful series. It was Carolyn's idea in the month of April to help <laughs> all of the employees to think about how to handle the stress of uh, this pandemic a little bit better and uh, sort of here's some better coping strategies about uh, all manner of health things. It seems like every time I start one of these, something happens right outside that window that just completely flummoxes me. <laughs> Somebody pulled into the driveway. We're social distancing people. <laughs> they left out. Okay, so I'm really happy to be here. Today's topic is uh, coping at home, and we're focusing on two aspects of coping at home. One is nutrition, and the other is exercise. So we're gonna talk about nutrition and exercise. And I have some information that um, was shared with me that I'm gonna share with y'all. Uh, Jonathan, Suzanne, if y'all want to weigh in at any point, mm -hmm. please do, but I'm just gonna roll through some of that stuff that y'all sent. And then at the end, we'll have time for question and answer from all of you. So to get started, I will talk about who I have with me here today. Well, first I'll mention myself. I'm an assistant professor in the Capstone College of Nursing, a clinical health psychologist by training. I do research in integrated behavioral health, opioid treatment, and LGBTQA plus health. I got my doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in clinical psychology. I have with me Jonathan Wingo. He's the Associate Professor and Chair in the Department of Kinesiology. He does research on human responses to exercise and physical activity in hot ambient conditions, stuff around hydration and sweating and heat stress responses and physical work performance optimization. He has his uh, PhD from the University of Georgia in exercise science and did a postdoc at the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine at Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas, UT Southwestern Medical Center. I'm really happy to have him here and he's gonna to talk to us about exercising. And then I also have Suzanne Henson, who's an assistant professor and registered dietitian with the University Medical Center at the University of Alabama. Uh, she does, is responsible for the education, coordination, and provision of nutritional information to resident physicians and medical students and assists UMC patients in the promotion of their health. And she's Alabama's delegate to the National Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She has her master's in human nutrition and a BA in journalism. All right, so the outline for today, we're gonna talk a touch about stress eating, making health and nutrition a priority, exercise advice, and then we're gonna do some questions. So I pulled this from the American Psychological Association. Uh, this is not pandemic information. This is non-pandemic information, so you can imagine what's happening with it right now. But it said that 38% of adults report overeating or unhealthy or eating unhealthy foods in the past month due to stress. So almost half of us. And then it also said that um, adults overeat or eat unhealthy foods due to stress. 49% uh, said that they do that weekly or more often than weekly. Sometimes it's a little challenging to move the little boxes around while I'm trying to read the slides. So why do they overeat or eat unhealthy foods when stressed? 33% said it distracts them from what is causing them to be stressed and 34% say it's a habit. So we are all sitting at home now by our fridges and stressed. So stress eating may be something that's happening right now. And that's the thing we can respond to in two ways, exercise and nutrition. So um, this information comes from the American Society for Nutrition. They have a great website, making health and nutrition a priority during the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll be presenting some information from that. So they have three steps that you can take to stay healthy during the coronavirus. And this is step one, minimize trips to the supermarket during the pandemic and eat healthy. So ways you can maximize this is to plan ahead. Uh, visualize breakfast, lunch, and dinner for at least five days. Some of the recommendations say to uh, try to buy two weeks worth of groceries. I know some people have managed to do that. That is a very high bar. 
very difficult for many of us to accomplish. So think about minimizing your exposure. So like if you can plan five days out, that's good. If you can get seven days, that good, that's good. If you can get two weeks, more power to you. Uh, but a lot of us have trouble with that. Um, think nutrition. The healthiest meals emphasize whole grains, vegetables, and fruits with smaller meat portions. And there's two reasons that's, that's important. Uh, one reason is that it's better for your bodies, which this is a very specific time when it's really good to eat healthy and have lots of vegetables and have your immune system functioning really well. Uh, but the other thing is a lot of our snack foods tend to exhaust quickly which means we would have to go back to the store more quickly to get them as well. So by thinking nutritious and eating healthier meals, we'll actually sustain ourselves better. So make a shopping list and use it. This has been a huge challenge for me. I have both culturally and because my lifestyle is go, 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 go. I have the habit of just stopping at the grocery store and getting what I need for today or maybe today and tomorrow. So I don't use shopping lists and I've had to start using shopping lists. So that's a good one. Think about it. Uh, one of the things that I hope I get to carry forward is it helps me not to forget things when I go to the store, which I do on a regular basis. And it also can help you to avoid impulse buying when you do go. Go easy on frozen dinners. You can actually check on this, but most pre-made frozen dinners are high in unhealthy things. Uh, some of them are healthier than others, and if you get used to looking at the nutrition labels, you can find out that it's hard to do right now in the stores because we don't want to linger in the stores. So think about going to what some websites and looking. Uh, limit your purchases of tempting foods like chips, sodas, cookies, and ice cream. Ice cream doesn't last very long during a stressful time. So <laughs> thinking about limiting it and rationing it while you have it is good. Uh, keep your costs down, consider low cost alternatives. And there were a couple of uh, examples provided. One is that instead of just buying hummus, which can go bad in a few days, you could buy some canned chickpeas and then make your own hummus in a food processor. I've actually done that and it's delicious. And another is flexitarianism, which is choosing some days to not eat meat or choosing which meals you eat meat more strategically. Meat is one of the harder things to, uh, to access and store right now. So that's one way you could think about um, keeping your costs down. So another thing they suggested is to think about your friends and neighbors, especially older adults and those with health conditions. Can you save them a trip to the grocery store? This is not a situation where you should get a big hug for helping them out. But if you can leave stuff on their porch, that could be really, really useful and save them a potential exposure to something that, that could be really bad for them. And then try online shopping. It can save you time and help you keep your social distance. Uh, I've been talking to some of my friends lately about how different all of this would have been 10 years ago. And online shopping is just one of the biggest changes. Okay, so. Um, while you are at the store, here are some important tips. Use a disinfecting wipe to wipe your hands and grocery cart handles and then put the wipe in the trash. A lot of the stores even still have these around their baskets. Um, a lot of the stores you'll notice are also habitually wiping down the, the carts uh, regularly. Um, be prepared for the unexpected. Supermarkets are running low on many items. Be sure to take your own bags and be ready with a backup plan if an ingredient you need is unavailable. And also I had the, the strange realization halfway through my last shopping trip about a week ago that they had put lanes in the grocery store where you, you're supposed to go up and down one. And I got dirty looks for about seven minutes before I noticed the signs on the floor. So be aware of that. Keep your eyes open um, and notice that the stores are now implementing these strategies to help us keep our distance while we're doing the shopping. Um, keep the less fortunate in mind. Contribute to local pantries and soup kitchens now. And when it's over, donate any extra food you stocked up that is still fresh and safe to eat. And as much as possible, use contactless payment or credit cards. A lot of our phones now have built in where we can just hold our phone near a sensor and it'll pay. Um, but if you do have to use the keypad, then use your knuckle 
to hit the buttons and then make sure you hand sanitize after. Tip number two, eat out safely during the coronavirus pandemic with restaurant curfews. So a lot of restaurants in our area are still providing food. Um, you can still do curbside pickup with them. And at this point, they've got the process down really well. So if you call them, they'll let you know what you've got to do. Um, but then the, the website suggested immediately taking the, home, the food home and eating it hot with your family right then. And really encouraged to make eating together at home a positive experience. They offered a couple of tips to get the family involved. Kids can help set the table, pour the water, make salad or great cheese. You can try new recipes right now because you might have a little extra time to cook. Things you might never have made like homemade pizza or roasting a whole chicken or cooking meatballs from scratch. I've seen so many friends baking bread right now, which is rediscovering one of the most amazing things in life, I think. I have the fondest memories of childhood when my mom was baking bread. <laughs> Reconnect with the family, eat together at the table or spread a blanket on the floor and have an indoor picnic and be sure to separate meal time from TV time. Now is a good time to sort of refocus on some of the things that matter the most to us. Tip number three, think positive. Mindset is vital to getting through this pandemic physically, mentally, and mentally healthy. So they suggest to practice positive stress management strategies like walking the dog, calling a friend, or soaking in the tub. And we're gonna talk about exercising in just a second. Stick with your routine as much as you can. Go to bed and get up in the morning at your usual times. Try to eat your meals at the usual times. Try to keep like some of your daily schedule going. And in particular, uh, with sleep, getting up at the same time every day is one way to try to keep your sleep well. There's some interesting data that Fitbit published about how the pandemic and the stress is really affecting all of our sleeps. So keeping really good sleep habits is important. And then as much as you can, manage your boredom. Stay busy and engaged. Resist hanging around the fridge. That is one thing that will definitely result in negative eating is if you're hanging around the fridge just because you're bored. Okay, so they also published a pretty long list of long-lasting nutrition-packed foods. So when it comes to breads, they suggested corn tortillas, whole grain English muffins, bagels, uh, breads, wraps, frozen whole wheat waffles. For grains, there was oatmeal and quick cooking pasta, brown rice, couscous, for sauces, you can get tomato, uh, tomato, 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 pasta sauce and salsa, soups and broths, canned, frozen, uh, shelf-stable cartons with beans. There are tons of types of beans you can get. Uh, and if you've never made beans starting from just dried packs, like this is a great time to learn that skill in your Instapot or your slow cooker because it can be so, they, they are just delicious when you learn to do them right with spices and stuff. I actually have a family that grew up eating lots of beans, which most families didn't. So I'm like getting back to my roots now by cooking a bunch of beans. It's pretty funny. All right, also you wanna have nuts and seeds handy for your healthy snacks. Those are really good. And uh, particularly if we're eating less meat in our diet now, having some extra nuts would be good. And then think about having some flavorings, uh, things with dried herbs and spices and vinegars, mustards, uh, steak sauces, lemon and lime juice and light dressings. And then they have some of the fresher things that we would usually get and some recommendations for that. So uh, getting sturdy fresh fruits like apples or citrus or dried fruits or getting some frozen fruits. For vegetables, they say sturdy fresh vegetables like celery and broccoli, onions and potatoes. Um, you, can keep, you can get some that are frozen. Um, if you get them canned, look for the low sodium versions. Or oh, you lost them. Yes. Here we go. Oh we, oh, we just had a connection problem for a second. Oh. Where did y'all last hear me? Celery. Yeah. Celery? Okay. Sturdy <laughs> vegetables. Um, there are also, you can get refrigerated, frozen, canned juices. Uh, there are shelf stable milks that you can get, which last longer. Uh, for eggs, uh, egg whites and cartons might last uh, a while. Um, 
but also uh, there are a bunch of local farmers that are providing fresh eggs too with curbside pickup. Um, cheeses, uh, chicken, you can get frozen or canned. Seafood you could get canned. Uh, there are also frozen, uh, you know, shrimp and tuna and salmon. And then beef, uh, you can get pre-made with lean ground beef patties and meatballs and stuff. So think about getting long lasting foods and planning out your, your meals ahead of time. So before we move into exercise, Suzanne, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I shared this with Carolyn and I'll use myself as an example because you talked about getting on schedule. And I think that's important. I've alternated between being on campus and being at home. And I found that because when I wasn't on campus, the lack of structure really affected my food habits, my hydration habits. And for a, probably a good number of people who may be watching this either live or um, when it's taped, <clears throat> you may be taking a medication that is greatly affected by particularly your hydration status. Okay? And I'll use uh, myself, I take uh, hydrochlorothiazide, which is a diuretic. And if you're not well hydrated and you take that drug, you can get dehydrated quickly, which can be dangerous. So <clears throat> I found for myself that I had to, even though I didn't have the structure that I do Monday through Friday, eight to five when everything's normal for my own health. <clears throat> and I think also you mentioned the sleeping habits. That's so crucial because sleep is, is so tied to your immune function. And then also the food choices you make when you're tired, um, <clears throat> when your sleep schedule is off, you tend to make choices that you wouldn't make otherwise. Okay. So <clears throat> just wanted to contribute that, but also really to say thank you for mentioning the produce markets. I mean, our local produce markets, whether it's um, our large produce market down on Jack Warner Parkway or our smaller locally owned um, markets, they're all offering, as you mentioned, curbside service, which is fantastic because when this all started, they were just coming back online um, after the winter. And so they fresh produce that had just come in, um, fresh plants, which is a great way to get out. I know Jonathan is going to talk about being more active, but, um, but really supporting those local farmers. And, and I've tried to um, not um, kind of do a mix of preparing foods, but also supporting these local restaurants who are trying to make it right now. And on um, social media, you'll find groups that are following restaurant owners and they can they put up their specials daily and you know these are the the people in our community that we go to when we have an event we want them to sponsor or contribute to and i think now it's our time to give back to them yeah yeah that i i've been uh getting the curbside pickup from the farmer's market and they have a facebook uh event that you can click to where you can reach out to all of the uh, farms and different produce providers there. Um, maybe we can share that with them, Carolyn. Uh, Could I add something real, real quick? Sure. Um, of course, my area is more the exercise, but one thing I thought I would add that um, I haven't heard mentioned. Uh, but some of the local restaurants yeah. are sending out trucks, which seems like a pretty neat way to support them during this time. So. If that's something you haven't already heard about, you know, you might consider getting with your neighborhood leadership if you have like a homeowners association or something like that and maybe call up a, a restaurant to see if they're willing to come out, you know, for like a two hour block or something on a weekday and, you know, serve the neighborhood dinner. And it's a good way. It's kind of a win win. So. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I know my homeowners association has been doing that. And I have um, I live in a garden home community, so I have older adults, um, retirees living there. And it's a great way to provide them when they may, you know, they may be immunocompromised and so they want to get out. And so it's, it's fantastic that homeowners associations have done that. And also it's kind of a bit of socialization safely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're talking to different people. And I'll say about the curbside pickup of restaurants. Uh, I've had some friends say, but isn't that dangerous? And, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I say back to them is, Restaurants are suddenly discovering health 
<laughs> they're not suddenly discovering how to keep you from getting sick. Like this is something restaurants do every single day when there's not a pandemic <laughs> is figuring out how to prepare and serve you food that's safe in a safe ways so that you don't catch all sorts of other things besides coronavirus. So uh, that's actually the, the health experts have weighed in and said that it's, it's safe. And the restaurants are taking it seriously too. They're not letting people come to work if they're sick or anything like that. I have a question, Suzanne. I know um, a lot of families have kids that are younger kids, uh, all ages that are at home right now with them. Do you have any suggestions for parents trying to, you know, involve their children in their nutrition while they're all at home together? I had this discussion with a, um, a friend yesterday. She said, I've got a middle schooler at home. I've got a high schooler at home. And um, she teaches um, full time for the university. <laughs> so, she said, I've got every age range that I'm trying to not only feed, but also teach right now. And so we talked about, she was getting with her sons, um, doing some food activities. And, um, and they were actually, I think, going out fishing yesterday in a little pond near where she lives. <laughs> so trying to, um, but you know, it's, it's a great time to introduce kids to foods that they may not have tried before. So at that produce market, you know, maybe request, uh, cause you can, go online and request an order and put something in there and maybe make that get your child involved. If it's something like a soft vegetable, such as, to use a butter knife to cut, you know, for younger children, that's an idea. And I know so many families, um, you know, all of a sudden they, they're homeschooling and they didn't plan on doing that. And so you can include into some of those activities they have to do. So just, the tip there, but I feel for all the parents who are homeschooling and they're also full-time employees somewhere. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Uh, I was I did a lot of cooking in my family when I was younger, and so when I got into college, and none of my friends knew how to cook anything <laughs> to feed themselves, that was amazing to me. So this is a great opportunity to get kids involved in that part of it. Um, for the the curbside farmer's market, uh, you do have to order that several days ahead so that they can prepare it for you. So just to uh, give you all a heads up about that. And there are lots of other local companies too that are providing essential services to keep in mind. I know my friend uh, Soapy Jones at Left Hand Soap Company mm -hmm. has been working really hard to get hand sanitizer out and soap yes. out to everybody. So think about uh, our local companies as well. Yeah, and I have one a question one. from somebody who um, had asked about bringing your own grocery store bags. Um, is is there any um, any ideas about if that's safe or should we just use the plastic disposable bags? Suzanne, you were going to make a comment, and then we'll answer the bag question. Oh, okay. Um, well, Kara, what I was also going to say, um, Josh, thank you so much for um, recommending these local businesses. Also look to restaurants because restaurants um, are also packaging groceries right now. So mm -hmm. for families, it's not just buying a meal. It's, you know, you can, I mean, I've seen several um, restaurants mm -hmm. on social media where they, they have paper, paper products, um, bread, so that you don't even have to go into a grocery store if you don't want to, or if you don't feel safe doing that. Um, but that's another way to support our local restaurants because they've gotten really creative in trying to, you know, support their, themselves and their employees. Great. Okay. So about the bags, uh, the question was that I had mentioned a comment saying, bring your own bags, but then they're saying not to do that. Um, any of y'all have a comment about that, whether or not to bring your own bags to the grocery store or not? I mean, I've been... I've been bringing my own bags, um, but I leave them in the car and take the groceries out. So that's what I've been doing. But I, I mean, having, I live alone, so I do go to the grocery store a little bit more frequently than others. And um, so what I've noticed, or, um, and uh, I've noticed the employees wiping down cart handles um, the basket handles, shelves. I mean, grocery stores have really stepped up um, mm -hmm. to protect the public and their employees. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, and I see some of the panelists are commenting on that. 
Um, I think it's a matter of what you feel comfortable with. Um, so, and I see that somebody's mentioned about grocery store employees don't want to handle bags. I always handle my own bags. Um, I don't just put it for someone to bag. I put things in the bag, but I think that's just a, a, a matter of preference, Carolyn. I mean, since I work in healthcare, um, there's, you know, I, I'm here. I have my mask. Um, so it's just, I think it's just a matter of um, kind of what you feel most comfortable with. Yeah. And, you know, the environment and, and being careful about usage of resources is really important to me personally. But this is also a situation where I think we have a, a more pressing concern mm -hmm. right now. So I'm using the bags from the grocery store. And when I get home, I take the groceries out of the bags. I don't put them up on the counter. I put them on the floor, take the groceries out of the bags. And then I put all the bags inside one of the bags. Um, I am currently keeping those to try to recycle them, but that might change, you know, outside of my house. And then you can think about disinfecting the floor where you put the bags. Um, it's a good thing to be thinking about your shoes if you go out and disinfecting your shoes and not tracking your shoes through the house anyway. So that's something that you could wrap up into that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and one of our uh, attendees said that they do self-checkout, so they're the only person touching the bags. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're regularly watching, washing your bags, that, that's uh, an important part of it. One of the people asked about which restaurants are selling groceries. I think I saw that the Baumhauer restaurants are selling groceries. Do you know? They are, and that, I'm actually replying to that um, attendee here in just a second. Um, Baumhauer has started doing that. Blue Plate has been doing that. Um, I know Gourmet Kitchen, um, which does prepared meals to go. They had um, paper towel, paper products one weekend. So just look, look online if you're on social media, but I will respond uh, to this attendee's question so that everybody can see it. Great. Um, some of these restaurants are. And if you have a question, I've noticed some folks are raising their hands. Please enter the question into the chat box so that we can see what it is. Uh, it's hard for us to track the hands going up. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move into exercise now. So Dr. Wingo sent me uh, these resources from the American College of Sports Medicine. I'm gonna read y'all some of the tips that they gave and then we're gonna uh, do some question and answer. So some uh, recommendations here for doing some activities while social distancing and not being able to go to your gym like you normally would and stuff. Some of the recommendations they had for aerobic activities, uh, indoor, put some music on and walk, walk briskly around the house or up and down stairs for 10 or 15 minutes, two to three times a day. Dance to your favorite music, jump rope if your joints can handle it or do an exercise video. Use home cardio machines if you have them. I've been seeing so many people talking about the uh, exercise resources they've been finding on YouTube where people have been leading through the, the kinds of group exercises that you might have done previously at your gym, you can do in your living room now watching your computer. Um, for outdoor activities, if allowed by your government, walk or jog around your neighborhood, uh, stay at least six feet away from others, although I've heard that those buffer zones should be wider and I bet we hear more about that in question and answer. Uh, be active in a local park. Spending time in nature may enhance your immune function. Wash your hands when you get home. Go for a bicycle ride or do some gardening and lawn work. Spring is here in Alabama. And then play active games with your family. For a strength training, download a strength workout app to your smartphone, such as the seven minute workout. Do a strength training video, perform yoga. Deep breathing and mindfulness can also reduce anxiety. It's a great time to develop a daily practice for yoga. Find ways to do simple muscle strengthening exercises around your house, such as squats or sit to stands from a sturdy chair, push-ups against a wall, the kitchen counter or the floor, and lunges or single leg step-ups on stairs. So there were also some question and answer in that handout and uh, some of these were um, mentioned and I put them here. I'm under quarantine, but not infected. Should I limit my physical activity? And it said there are no recommendations now. Will exercise help me prevent, will help prevent me from getting virus? 
moderate intensity physical activity can boost your immune system. However, uh, extra high intensity training may actually work to suppress your immune system. So no running full marathons right now, right, Dr. Lingo? <laughs> so uh, what if my kids are home with me? Being active with kids is the most fun of all fine activities that you can do together. And I've got some recommendations for that in the next few slides. Are there precautions I should take? The most important strategy to prevent infection is to avoid coming into contact with others who are infected with COVID-19. So whatever you're doing, that should be the priority. If you begin to have symptoms, follow the CDC recommendations. And we talked about those in a previous webinar. I'm under quarantine and infected. Should I limit my physical activity? People who are infected but without symptoms can continue moderate intensity activity but need to use symptoms as a guide. Maintain quarantine to prevent spreading the coronavirus to others. If you develop fever, cough, or shortness of breath, stop physical activity and reach out to your doctor or healthcare provider. So, Keeping your kids active, I figured any of the parents on this would be really happy to have some tips about this. Uh, kids generally have high energy, so keeping them indoors can be hard. Okay, physical activity guidelines in a nutshell for ages three to five. Preschool age children should be active for a total of three hours each day at different intensities, light, moderate, or vigorous. Uh, some of that would include bouncing off the walls, I imagine. Ages six to 12, kids need 60 minutes of physical activity every day. This includes activity for their hearts, muscles, and bones. Exercise should be vigorous on three days of the week. Children can do five or 10 minutes several times a day or play for 30 to 60 minutes once or twice. Every active minute counts. And again, the recommendation, make family time, active time, schedule movement breaks and active play into your daily routine. So here are some indoor options for kids, uh, active gaming and online resources to get kids moving. Here, there are some links here for yoga, active indoor videos, which are dance moves and things like that. Fun for families, uh, they have a bunch of active home activities. And then the American Heart Association's 25 ways to get moving at home. Uh, so I love some of these recommendations. Having a dance party with your kids sounds like a lot of fun and then you can go back and forth between sharing who's picking which songs and which DJs or, or um, who gets to DJ. Uh, I use Spotify for music and it notified me yesterday that there are now, there's now a Spotify app for kids, which limits the content that kids can access. So you could hand your kid the Spotify for kids app and let them DJ your dance party. Um, going on a color hunt, hiding colorful objects around the house. Now that we have just left Easter weekend, this should be prime on the brains of many people. Uh, Easter eggs around the house, and you can have different things in them as well. Uh, Nerf basketball, indoor obstacle courses, uh, paper plate badminton. They don't have forts here, but forts are a lot of fun. You can build a fort, tear it down, build it up again. Martial arts, karate, and judo. And then instant recess to break up sitting time. Everyone gets up and does jumping jacks and marches around or does something silly for a few minutes several times a day. I think that's a great way to get across the concept of staying active even if you can't be in places where it's easy to be active. Okay, backyard ideas and games. Kids can do anything active in the backyard if it's with their siblings, um, but they should not be playing with friends. Set up a soccer goal, play tag or dodgeball, try jump rope or double dutch. That is uh, down there, hopscotch. Uh, other active games are to create an obstacle course, do hide and seek, do egg hunts. Uh, it was funny to see the hopscotch thing uh, in the handout. And I thought, wow, I guess there are people who don't know what a hopscotch looks like. <laughs> okay, so outdoor activities in a park or neighborhood. Remember to keep your social distance and wash hands, but you can walk or run, make it fun, have a contest, see who can get somewhere first, play I Spy or sing songs. Go on a no-touch scavenger hunt. Look for different colors, shapes, animals, dogs, or other items. Ride a bicycle, skateboard, or scooter on a bike path or in, in a parking lot. There are actually lots of empty parking lots these days. 
Um, and then you can also uh, teach children how to learn bike safety while they're exploring. You can do practice drills for just about any sport, uh, explore the trails at a local park, or walk the dog every day as a family. I'm seeing tons of people doing that. I think that's so cool to see so many families being active together when you wouldn't have normally seen that. Okay, so that was the last of the comments about exercise. So now we'll open up question and answer about physical activity. Carolyn, did you see any questions as I was talking? Oh, definitely uh, recommend to do judo in, don't do judo inside <laughs> without an appropriate mat. I was from Larry, Canada. That's pretty <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I've been telling people this is not the time to do anything on top of a three-story ladder. <laughs> like, keep in mind, you don't want to go to the hospital. No. So, you know, <laughs> keep that. <laughs> anyway, there's we a lot of you left. Here, if you might not be good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dr. Wingo, I will say I, the, I posted some of the materials that you sent over on our resource website, and I really did enjoy the um, high intensity uh, workout plan that you provided because it's something that everybody can do um, at home in their house. Yeah, I, I liked that one as well. A couple of things. I guess, I mean, pandemic or not, these are all good things that you can certainly do when this is all you know, hopefully over uh, the ACSM where these resources came from, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends between 150 and 300 a week of physical activity. And, that, and that's a lot. Uh, so the, the good news there is, I mean, if, if you can achieve that, that's great. But if you're someone who wasn't really exercising before the pandemic, you know, maybe now you've got a little more time on your hands. It's a great time to start. And the good news is anything is good. So I, I encounter people oftentimes that are like, well, you know, I would exercise, but it, it just looks so miserable. Or, you know, people are draped over a treadmill sweating and don't look like they're enjoying themselves. And unfortunately, that's the image a lot of people have of exercise and being physically active. But it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, anything is good. Any kind of moving around and being active is, is good and has health benefits. It doesn't all have to be sort of this all out, you know, you're exhausted type of workout. Um, the, the thing I'll add about the high intensity, you know, these sort of short high intensity workouts, you know, maybe seven minutes, whatever, that's what the handout was on. There's different versions of these out there. The only caution I have there is, um, be, be a little careful if you're not accustomed to that, where, where some people get into trouble. Obviously, we want everybody to be physically active if you're capable, um, but perhaps if you've been sedentary before, just kind of ease into it, maybe start out at kind of what for you feels moderate. Um, you know, so like on a one to 10 scale of 10 is, you know, as vigorous as you can imagine exercising, you know, maybe start off in that sort of three to five range, maybe up to six, something like that. And as you become more accustomed to it, then you can work in that sort of seven, eight, nine range. But so I think with those high intensity bouts, what's nice is they're really short and you get a lot out of them. But again, just kind of listen to your body. Um, if you're not accustomed to doing high intensity things, then be careful. We don't like, like Suzanne mentioned, we don't want you injuring yourself. Um, and that, that's where people do encounter problems is they're doing high intensity exercise that they're not accustomed to. So if you're not used to that sort of thing, don't just start out at the going as hard as you possibly can, you know, ease into it and then work your way up to that. Same thing with 150 minutes a week. I mean, if you can hit that minimum, that's great. But if you're not there right now, well then just uh, work your way up to it. Whatever you can do is good. And then as far as like the kids go, I would, I would add, uh, to keep it a lot like school. You know, many kids either get PE or recess or in some schools both. And so uh, try to keep that going. Um, there's good evidence that getting some physical activity actually helps kids concentrate better. I think it improves, there's some evidence it improves their, their cognition. So, you know, maybe before that math lesson, let them, let them go out and get some fresh air, run around a little bit. And you, you might be surprised, they might actually come in and be able to better focus on some of those hard Or subject keeping their attention so uh, again keeping some normalcy there um, uh, and I think yeah I think that, that's the things oh thing I was thinking Josh was talking uh, that, that you could think about is many of us are, are very competitive by nature enjoy competition so I think making some of these things competitive can add a, another layer of um, maybe enjoyment like 
example, my daughters uh, you had like a fort building competition. So obviously the kids weren't together. They were all in their own respective houses, but they all posted pictures of their forts or videos of their forts on um, you know, social media, that type of thing. And then the youth minister, you know, de declared a winner and sent out kind of a prize or something. And so I think things like that, where you kids active, maybe they record or capture whatever it was that they did. And even though they're maybe not able to get together with their friends in the form of a play date, they can still sort of so-called, you know, compete with their friends by, by posting the most creative, whatever it was that they did, uh, game or drill or fort or, or whatever. Um, so those are some other things. I have some friends who ran a virtual race against each other. Yeah. They all yeah. synced up at the same time and, and they all agreed to run the same distance. And then they were, they, you yeah, know, at the neat. end, like talking about who had finished first. That's neat. Yeah. Um, we actually have a question. Um, somebody was wanting to know what is the best way for someone to get started exercising who um, haven't been physically active before. Any suggestions? Yeah, so, um, well, there are some basic recommendations. The, the same source that, that this all came from, American College of Sports Medicine, has some basic information on their website. Actually, there's a lot there that you can spend a lot of time on there. But um, for someone who's not, hasn't been physically active previously, um, it's sort of what I was saying a few minutes ago. I, I think find, well, let me back up. The recommendation is to try to hit 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity, aerobic type act activities uh, most days of the week. So again, if you're not, if that's not something you can achieve right now, then just realize that's a goal to work towards. And then if you can build in a couple of days of some types of strength building activities, then that, that's really great too. So if you're someone who's unaccustomed to any of that and is just trying to get started, I think a great place to start out is walking or whatever form of ambulation that you take. If you're in a wheelchair, getting out and uh, feeling around your neighborhood or wherever it is that, that you are. But if, if you're able to walk, getting out and walking, I think is a great place to start because walking from a brisk walk for most people is considered moderate intensity exercise. So if you're doing something that increases feeding just a bit, maybe increases your heart rate just a bit for people, moderate intensity. Or, or even as be sweating. Not as far as a, a, a way to gauge intensity. So if you're if you're with someone, obviously we have to be a little careful with the whole social distancing. So, if, but if you're with someone that, that's that's a member or someone that you're exercising with, if you can kind of barely carry on a conversation with them, then that's a that's a pretty good intensity. If you can talk really easily, and you're not even really struggling at all, well, then you know you maybe could up it just a little bit. But if you're able to kind of barely, <clears throat> excuse me, barely keep on a, a conversation, that's, a, that's kind of a good way. So again, back to the question, I, I think walking is a good place to start, <coughs> setting a goal each day of a time a limit that you can achieve. One important thing that was, it was in some of the information that was presented, but, but in case you missed it, it doesn't have to be continuous. Really important point to remember that the, the nice thing with this 150 minutes, which you could break down 30 minutes a day, if that's your daily goal, have to be 30 minutes continuously. So if you can get in five minutes here, 10 minutes there, I mean, any amount is good. So breaking it up into smaller bouts, if, if that helps it be more achievable for you, then that's a good place to start. So if you're like, well, I can't walk for 30 minutes straight, I get either too tired or I don't have the time because of my work schedule or, <clears throat> or whatever the reasons might be, you're taking care of kids, well, can you go take a five minute break or a 10 minute break and knock out a, a portion of it there? And can you do that a few times per day? Before you know it, you've got your 30 minutes in. If you do that five days a week, you've got 150 minutes. So there's ways to be kind of creative in, uh, in capturing your physical activity that way. You get started. Um, in terms of like the training, it's kind of hard right now for a lot of people because maybe you don't have access to a gym, something like that. So ways you can be creative there would be using body weight exercises. So if you're able to do like a push-up or, or you know, a handful of push-ups, that's, that's something you could do. If, if that's something you're not really able to do, you could be uh, surprised at ways you can be creative. Do you have a paint can around? You know, you could actually lift a paint can as kind of like a curl. Um, you can lift, you can freeze a water bottle and uh, lift, you know, a water bottle uh, as kind of a handheld weight, almost like a dumbbell. 
So there's ways to be creative with things around your house that you might be able to lift. And, and again, there's, there's resources online that can give you some ideas for actual lifts you can do. And you can do um, using a chair, you know, and this was in one of the handouts, you can do um, tricep extensions basically. So that things like that, you can do air squats where you literally just bend down or get up out of a chair. Those are all ways to kind of do strength type exercises. And then you've got your walking, your jogging or bike riding as ways to do aerobic exercise. I think all those would be ways to kind of get started. Just be, again, be mindful if you're not accustomed to sort of the strength training types of things, you don't want to get uh, overly sore. And so if, if you kind of ease into it so that you're not so sore the next day or two after. Um, yeah, definitely. Sounds good. So um, uh, just following up on what you said about the 150 minutes, if people just do 15 minutes a day and just three days in that week, push that into 30, they hit your 150 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that daily practice mm -hmm. of doing something active is really the, the critical part of getting there. Um, so uh, I was going to ask you about what like buffer zones look like, how that's different when you're running or walking than if you're standing still. So could you sure more, what you mean so by we've been told to keep at least six feet away. It looks like the CDC oh. might update that guideline to 13 feet based on the flow patterns they've been they've been finding. Uh, how does that convert to if we're walking behind somebody at the park or on a run in a park? Now I see what you mean by the buffer zones. Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I haven't read or seen anything that adjusts that. It doesn't mean it's not out there. So some of you, if you've seen something, feel free to chime in. Um, I don't know that I've seen anything that alters that during exercise. Um, so I think there is kind of, to the extent possible, be socially... Um, it is, I can't, um, you know, everyone knows the state we're in, so I don't think it's insulting to people. Hopefully I'm okay. I saw a little note, my internet was unstable, so hopefully I'm not timing out here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say try to maintain those same buffers, you know, that minimum of six. I used to do it in, uh, like at a park on someone, they all hmm. Coming around like say you're jogging and they're walking you give them that heads up that you're coming around but, but you you come around them at, at, at a minimum of six feet away from them as kind of like a common courtesy like for example I know in our neighborhood my wife and I like to get out and jog and walk and we'll cross paths with other people but you know we just make sure you know that we're out away from like if they're on the sidewalk we go into the street you know and we're six feet away or more in the street or we're on the other side of the street on the other sidewalk I think there's ways to those buffers while out exercising. So I would say I don't really have anything to to add to adjust those. I would say while out exercising though, do do honor them, um, just yeah. like you would if you were in a grocery store. Anyway, so in other words, just because you're outside doesn't mean you should ignore those buffer zones. Yeah, um, I, I I saw an article that said think about expanding them because of the way that things hang in the air and we're actually running into that air, but I don't have any numbers to go with that. Suzanne, I, I understand you have to leave a little early. Is there anything that you wanted to say before you go? They stopped out. It's a, okay, there you go. Okay, I think, okay, he's back. Okay, was there anything you wanted to say before you, you have to leave? Yeah, um, and, and thank you for this. I apologize, I have another um, online meeting at, um, at one, as Carolyn and I discussed yesterday, take, She's wonderful, but I can't wait to see people actually, you know, in the room together one day. But um, I would, do, again, just really encourage people, think about the schedule that you've got in this temporary new normal. Um, as I mentioned, you know, are you getting enough fluid? Are you eating regularly? Um, what's your sleep pattern like? Because all that really goes into your, your overall mood as well. Okay. And, um, and then do support those local businesses. You know, there was discussion in the chat um, box on that. Carolyn, later today, um, after my meetings, I'll send you some of those resources. Okay. Links to those for anybody who's interested. Because again, I think, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of 
food prep at home, I think it's also a great time to support um, the people that we know and have visited for years and trying to help them, you know, continue going until hopefully this passes or we're in a better period. So I'll send that to you later today. Okay. I have a question for Suzanne. Yeah. What do you do when you have um, bags and bags of frozen mixed vegetables? Because I think your husband ever bought, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I mean, you're just buying whatever, and I don't know what to do with all that. Come on, you're a dietitian. <laughs> okay, well, you know, you know how much when, when we did our grocery store tours with, um, with Will Bama with Better Bites, um, I love frozen vegetables because um, they can stay in the freezer forever. Um, mm -hmm right now but i think he's purchased over like five pounds is that right or more i don't even know okay um so, so we're still in spring so it's still a little bit cool outside soups are a fantastic way to use a lot stir are a fantastic way to use a lot um uh, so i mentioned from a colleague of mine another dietitian on campus hey holly groff um pasta <laughs> casseroles and then frittata which i follow holly on social media yeah and your meals are looking great holly that does look fantastic mm -hmm. so um so those are some ideas but uh, but yeah maybe don't send it to the grocery <laughs> store <laughs> i wasn't with them he just was <laughs> buying out of panic <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> so um anyway but it was a pleasure being with y'all today and i'm gonna step off and go to my next meeting but but thank you all and please stay safe um, those of us who are on campus can't wait to see more traffic back on campus again. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. I'll add about the frozen vegetables that one of my favorite quick meals is to make ramen and uh, steam up a bag of frozen vegetables and add it to some ramen with some sriracha. Mm -hmm. I actually do that instead of the, the seasoning packet that comes with the ramen. It's, really, oh, a good it's idea. delicious. Got me through college. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, other questions or comments? Well, um, Dr. Ringo, do you have any kind of, uh, do you have a go-to, what, what are you doing every day? Well, well uh, I kind of tend to practice what I preach, I guess. So even before the pandemic, I, I tend to, to run. I, I'm not a really competitive runner. I just, I sort of do it because if I've got 30 minutes to spare, Running is one of the best things personally that, that I can do, I feel like aerobically. Um, before the pandemic, I was also trying to go to the, the gym just to sort of lift weights, uh, you know, like I don't lift heavy or anything like that, but just to keep some strength training as part of my routine. I, I would do that maybe one day a week, maybe two uh, on good weeks. And then I was playing some tennis, but that's out right now. So the, the gym and the tennis are out. Um, I've been doing some running still. Um, I've been now biking a bit more than I have in many years. I used to do a lot of cycling years ago, but but I've uh, not really been doing that in recent years. So I've been doing some of that. Um, we get out. We have a dog and love to get out and walk the dog. We have a nice neighborhood for walking, so we've been doing a lot of that. Especially with the night. You know, other than this weekend, uh, we've been having some pretty nice weather, so we've been doing that. Um, I have tried the seven minute thing that I that I sent as the handout. And um, it's it's tough, but it but it's I think it's good if you can if you can. The nice thing about it is it's sort of self-regulating. You know, if you kind of go at your pace, you know, at your intensity, and so um, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, you know, just kind of turning your garage if you have a garage, you know, or a space like that, driveway, whatever it is, turning that into kind of like a little mini gym and just being creative with some of these body weight exercises. Those are the things that I'm doing, and then just trying to incorporate some games. You know, we've got a 12 year old. So we've done uh, daughter, and so we've um, built in some some games in the backyard type of thing, you know, soccer, golf, you know, where you who can mm -hmm. get the ball to this target in the fewest number of kicks, you know, that type of thing. Soccer, croquet, you know, soccer, tennis, basketball <laughs> in the driveway. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of what I've been doing. Those are good ideas. That reminds me of one of the things I think is uh, one of the best things to come out of this pandemic is that. Um, kids are actually getting to spend time around their parents on s such a consistent basis that there's more of that ability to sort of rub off on your kids about the things that are important to you and the things that you like doing. And uh, with our schedules, there's so much mismatch in the scheduling that it can be really hard to, to actually have that kind of time. So I, I think that's one of the hidden perks in what is otherwise a pretty bad time. 
Okay. Mm, Ali shared an article about social distancing from a Belgian study that um, we'll look at too. Uh, during uh, exercise, I should clarify. Great. Running, biking. So do you have any recommendations for people who are marathoners? Uh, I have some friends who are distance runners and that's just complicated. Yeah, that, that's tough, I guess. You know, um, again, I think the, the part about, I, I don't study exercise and immunity, but my sort of um, off the top of my head knowledge of that is that, and, and you did talk about it on one of your slides, you know, there is some evidence that if you're not accustomed to it, doing a lot of volume of exercise and a lot of a, a very high intensity may actually suppress some immune function. Whereas if you're doing sort of more moderate intensity exercise of kind of a more reasonable volume, then that actually may boost immune function. So I think the key there though, is what are you accustomed to? So for people that train for marathons and they, they do that routinely, then I think they're probably okay. Um, as long as again, they're doing all these other things we've talked about the social distancing and, maybe keeping even a bigger buffer when they're out exercising. So I think the good news right now is if they're in a place where they can find places to run, there's still ways to get in lots of distance, you know, to a runner, um, you can still get in your training. Um, you just got to kind of maybe be a little bit creative about, um, and maybe get a little boring because you may be having to run a lot of the same routes, you know, sort of over and over. Um, but I think it can still be done. That's the nice thing about running. Running is one of those sports that you can do it almost anywhere. Um, so that versus some others that are harder to do right now, I, I think uh, they can sort of cope, you know, manage that way. But, but back to what maybe you had said earlier in the talk, if, if you've not been doing marathons before, now's probably not a great time to decide <laughs> to just start, right? Uh, <laughs> So maybe maybe ease into it like okay maybe your goal is to do like a 5k or something like that uh so maybe start with that and and start doing there, there's all kinds of online training programs and things to get you through a 5k of course we got the crimson couch to 5k maybe virtually and all that so anyway those would be some things to uh, to think yeah. about the other day i was uh, on my porch working and one of my neighbors passed me running and then she passed six more times <laughs> it's like yeah. Good for you. Um, okay, uh, one of the attendees mentions the Down Dog app is free to anyone with a ua.edu address until July 1st, and there are great workouts on there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wingo. Thank you all for attending. I'll uh, put a plug in for the next talk, which yeah. is April 21st, and that's going to be Meditation as a Coping Tool with Rob Alley, and uh, he's awesome. I hope you all can join in for that one thank you everybody have a great day take care all right thank you thank you dr mingu